Well, we're going to go to our next speaker. Um, I just got a note that he may be having connection issues, but it's he sounds kind of upbeat about it. So we will see if we can. Oh, there he is. So our next speaker is John Marchant. Uh, John is a research assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. John works for Professor Mike Summers and applies NMR methods to study structure and dynamics of large RNA molecules. So the title of John's talk is Structural Characterization of Large RNAs from HIV-1 Using NMR. So um, go to it, Jan. Thanks, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, delighted to be able to talk about our work applying NMR to large RNA molecules. So um, thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation. Um, so just briefly, RNA is a, is a polymer where each residue comprises a, a chain of, of ribose sugars connected by a phosphate backbone and one of four different nitrogenous bases. It's um, relatively simple to prepare, especially compared to proteins, and incorporation of stable isotopes is also uh, relatively straightforward as, as long as the labeled precursors are available. Um, and the, the main methods for, for producing RNA are via solid phase synthesis, which allows for uh, residue specific labeling from phosphoramidite monomers, um, but is, is size limited to uh, certainly less than 100 nucleotides, and, and that's, that's pushing it. Um, and what we generally use is uh, in vitro transcription using T7 RNA polymerase. Um, in which you get uniform labeling by residue type via uh, incorporation of, of labeled NTP precursors. Um, it's, there's a relatively well or a well developed suite of NMR experiments, heteronuclear and homonuclear NMR experiments, which allow for chemical shift assignment and, uh, and acquisition of constraints for structure generation. Uh, but despite this, there's a, a lot less structural information available for RNAs uh, than for proteins. Um, only about 1% of PDB depositions are RNA structures, even though the human genome codes for more functional RNAs than, than proteins. Um, of, of those structures in the PDB, NMR is relatively well represented, making up about a third of all depositions, um, but they're generally quite small, um, as you can see from, from this histogram. The, the median is, is 24 nucleotides, and there's sufficiently few over 50 nucleotides that I can you know, list them all on, on this figure. Um, there are a few reasons for this. Uh, today, I'm gonna focus on, on these three major uh, contributors. So, so first we have limited chemical shift dispersion, so obviously leading to overlap, um, and that's due in large part to the similarity of, of the monomeric units only having four different nitrogenous bases as, as the kind of variation uh, as, as compared to, for example, with proteins that the different amino acids. Um, and second, most of the protons in RNA that, that we look at are carbon attached and without a trosy effect of any real size. Um, and so even relatively small RNAs show prohibitive line broadening of the proton signals when they're carbon-13 enriched. Uh, and finally, there's often little to, to no interactions between individual structured elements. And so defining the overall structure of, of a large RNA can be difficult. Uh, and as we'll see, I'm, I'm on message, isotope labeling is essential for, for addressing these uh, challenges. So the system I spend most of my time working on and, and thinking about is the, the rev response element from HIV-1. And, and the, the version that, that we're focusing on is 232 nucleotides, uh, which is about 75 kilodaltons. Um, and we can, it demonstrates a, uh, a few features of RNA that are worth quickly noting. So it comprises a number of base paired um, helices, double helices which uh, take a, an, an A form, um, the, which is stabilized by, uh, by hydrogen bonding. Um, they form stems and stem loops, which are separated by bulges and internal loops. Um, on the right here is, is a 2D proton nosy spectrum of the RRE without any isotope labeling. We do, um, for, for this spectrum at least, this is dissolved in D2O. And so we, we lose any exchangeable proton signals. So these are just the, the non-exchangeables. 
I, I imagine most people know that this is uh, a uh, this this uh, experiment correlates protons that are, are close in space, uh, and it's a key part of structural characterization uh, with NMR is is assigning these signals for use as restraints in structure calculation. Um, but even in the absence of assignments, we can use it as a, a sort of fingerprint for the structure. Um, the, the lack of long range interactions between structured elements can be beneficial here because it means that a divide and conquer approach can be successful. So if we generate smaller fragments based on this is a predicted secondary structure and compare their spectra to the spectrum from the full length molecule, it's apparent that at least uh, partially we, we have good matches, but for at least some, some residues. Uh, and in general, if the chemical shifts and NOE patterns match, um, from, from the fragment to the full length molecule, we take that as evidence that the structure is the same in the full length molecule and it's not being perturbed by interactions with other parts of the RNA. Um, but for this approach, we really are limited to a few outlying signals. Um, the bulk of the spectrum is just far too kind of overlapped and crowded, particularly the, the ribose signals um, are far too overlapped and crowded for any kind of um, meaningful comparison of the spectra. And so that leads on to our, our main tool for dealing with spectral overlap, which is incorporation of deuterium labeled NTPs. So here I'm showing an expanded view of a crowded region of, of that same nosy spectrum. Um, and, and this is for the, the RRE where every, every nucleotide, every NTP that we've used to create the RNA is fully proteated. Um, if we then, instead of using fully proteated UTP and CTP, use fully deuterated UTP and CTP from CIL, or perhaps others, according to preference, um, we, we see, and, and then if we also have a deuterate at the eight position of the purines, so H8s uh, are deuterated as well. The only um, kind of base proton that's left is the adenosine H2. And we get the only ribose protons left are from the A's and G's. And, and obviously that significantly simplifies our, our spectrum. Um, and it's much more tractable. You know, most of the signals here actually uh, are, are assignable. Uh, but we can make, you know, many, many different combinations of, of deuterium labeling schemes that both helps us to identify peaks in terms of their, their residue type but also uh, obviously uh, reduces the, the overlap that, that we have to deal with. And we might make, you know, certainly make tens of different combinations of, um, of deuterium labeling schemes, um, say for, for the RRE, probably close to, to 30 or so uh, at current count. And by using those along with our, um, our fragment spectra, uh, putting all of the spectra together, essentially, we can, we can assign, assign all of these uh, NOEs um, this analysis is quite complicated just due to the large number of spectra. None of the NMR experiments at this stage are complicated at all, but trying to compare 30 different nosy spectra and, and keep things uh, straight in your head can be a bit, a bit daunting. And so we're lucky that we have a, a long-standing collaboration with, uh, with Bruce Johnson, which has yielded a number of computational tools that help manage the spectra, manage the, the assignments, making sure that everything is, uh, is consistent. So the, the next challenge that we want to overcome is, uh, is in applying heteronuclear correlation experiments to large RNAs. So our, our favorite nucleus in general is the uh, adenosine H2. Um, it's got a large chemical shift dispersion, certainly relatively speaking, uh, and generally favorable relaxation properties um, in, in fully proteated uh, RNAs. But if we simulate uh, relaxation rates with carbon-13 label at the C2 position, you can see it leads to, to increasingly rapid uh, transverse relaxation. Uh, and this is borne out from kind of uh, real world data. So this is a, a slightly smaller um, uh, construct that's derived from the RRE. But if we make a heavily deuterated sample where the only protons are the adenosine H2 and H8 um, and, the, and the cytidine riboses, uh, we, we get this lovely sharp set of signals for these nice, nice dispersed H2s. If instead we, we use uh, carbon-13 labeled A's, we, we see that these nice uh, sharp H2 signals are broadened uh, essentially beyond uh, detection. 
Luckily, we, we have another option. So there's a relatively large um, two-bond proton nitrogen coupling in the purines that we can exploit to acquire heteronuclear correlation spectra for these large RNAs. So this is a, a, an HMQC from um, the RRE. I'm being told that my- Great. Um, so uh, where was I? Yeah, this is this, is this HMQC uh, using the two-bond proton nitrogen correlation. These nitrogens, um, they're not the, the sharpest signals. There's a large CSA, which uh, means for, for larger molecules, they're, they're quite broad, but they have basically no effect on the line width of the proton. And so you, we keep these really nice sharp H2s and, and it's completely feasible, certainly for RNAs the size of the, uh, the RRE. And, and we've used this, uh, this, this two-bond coupling from the H2 to, to these nitrogens for, for a number of experiments. So we can do re relaxation measurements on the nitrogens. This is a, a relatively simple analysis here. It's not really what we were doing these experiments for, but this is for the RRE, just looking at, at one signal here. We can measure T1 rows of this signal from this long extended uh, stem from the RRE measure the, the, the T1 rows and just from a, because it's so CSA dominated, it's, it's relatively easy to fit. We, we get a kind of effective correlation time of 150 nanoseconds. As I say, not a particularly detailed analysis here, but the, the experiment works quite nicely. Um, and we've also had some good luck applying um, a nice experiment from Michael Sattler's group, um, which again, starts with magnetization on the H2 and transfers to the N1 and then uses the two bond uh, NN coupling across the hydrogen bond to transfer to the, the base paired uracil. Um, so we get a kind of cozy type experiment where we can see wherever you see a cross peak here, it, it shows that you've got a base pair. And then to help us sign it, um, Sattler has experiments with carbon labeled uracil that, that transfer via the carbons, which, which won't work for, for our larger RNAs. But we find actually yeah, there's a if you're prepared to wait long enough, there's a, there's a very small direct coupling from the, the H5 to the N3. And so you can, you can link back to, to our assigned H5s from our uracils to, to look at, um, directly look at base pairing, even in quite large RNAs. Um, and, and I'll discuss some other experiments that, uh, that we use based on this, um, based on that correlation. When, when we talk about this final challenge. So the, the relative orientation of these secondary structure elements is hard to define. So NOEs obviously are a very local constraint um, and, and we don't really get many uh, NOEs between these independent structured elements, but um, it can be important for the function of the RNA. So in the RRE's case, for example, it's been proposed to be an important factor in recognition uh, of, of the RRE by its protein binding partner REV essentially the distance between two previously defined binding sites is thought to be important, but it's too far, obviously, for, for access from any kind of uh, NOE type of experiment. And so we want a way of, of determining kind of global details of the RNA. Um, and so we've had, we've had some, some initially promising results working with Nico Chandra, um, where by incorporating a uh, UNA binding loop somewhere into the RNA, and then um, introducing a paramagnetically tagged UNA protein, we can see pseudo contact shifts from, from this type of, uh, type of experiment. Um, one of the issues so far is that uh, often these, these stem loops are kind of pointing away out from the, the, the molecule. And so there's, there's a distance limit even for, um, for things like pseudo contact shifts. Um, and, and so for example, in, in this example, we really only see uh, measurable pseudo contact shifts in, in the UNA binding loop. Uh, and, and there are a few also in, in, in the stem preceding the loop. Um, so in, instead, I'm going to focus the rest of the talk on, on our approach for measuring RDCs in, in these large RNAs, which is, which is complicated by the fact that these nitrogen chemical shifts are, are very close to each other. Um, and so to, to kind of deconvolute the contribution of the, of the couplings to these two different nitrogens, we want to measure couplings to each independently, would um, potentially require very long se selective pulses to extract the individual contributions to the couplings. Um, but we noticed that the, um, the kind of relative contribution of the active and passive couplings to the intensity of, of the signals that, that we measure 
varies with the flip angle of the nitro of a nitrogen pulse in it, just in a simple HMQC. And we found that by taking the ratio of, of two different um, nitrogen pulse flip angles, we could get an expression in terms of, of only the passive coupling. Um, and it's obviously a very easy experiment to do, but there are some practical concerns. So uh, any miscalibration of those nitrogen pulses leads to, to really large, potentially very large offsets in, in the measured coupling. Because this, uh, this is a proton nitrogen RDC and it's you know, twice as far as a, as, a, as a one bond coupling in terms of distance, the RDCs that we're measuring are very small. Uh, and having a, a kind of error of, of four hertz in, in the measured coupling obviously wouldn't, uh, wouldn't work for us. Uh, and this is a problem because it's difficult to accurately calibrate um, these pulses, uh, mainly because the power output from, from the, the coil is inhomogeneous across the sample. So uh, just briefly, um, this type of experiment, we should um, be able to get rid of all of the signal that we've excited here, if we if we time it right and, and we have a perfect 90 degree pulse on the coupled nitrogens, we should be able to get rid of, of all the signal. But as we as we kind of sweep through different power levels for this 90 degree pulse, we never hit a perfect condition. We've always got a kind of 7% or so residual signal. And, and that's because there's always some part of the sample where you've not got a 90 degree, um, a perfect 90 degree pulse. But fortunately, this is something that, um, people have, have thought about previously. And um, there, are, there are adiabatic pulses that exist that are designed for a kind of uniform uh, rotation angle with B1 uh, inhomogeneity, like this Burr pulse is a B1 insensitive rotation pulse. We find as long as we meet the adiabatic condition, um, we get you know, no signal in this experiment and, and, and we think robust uh, control of, of the flip angle of, of these pulses. And so we can, we can measure, so th this is the kind of final experiment, we call it a variable flip angle HMQC, it's really simple, um, just an interleaved HMQC where we vary the flip angle of, of these, uh, these uh, Burr pulses. Um, and we can measure with, um, with uncertainties based on the, the noise, the signal to noise, et cetera, very low uncertainty, uh, a large number of RDCs for, for a large RNA such as the RRE uh, with, with very good sensitivity. Um, but there's no comparable method for measuring these couplings in large RNAs. And so we, we've got a model system which is um, derived from the five prime leader of MMLB that has two helices that are kind of defined into helical angle due to this, uh, this K-turn, which is 36 nucleotides with 10 adenosines. We can measure proton carbon couplings with just uniformly uh, carbon labeled um, NTPs. And we can measure the proton nitrogen two bond couplings using existing methods. This is a spin state selective experiment and using our new uh, variable flip angle approach. And we can see that the um, agreement between the couplings measured using the, the spin state selective and, and the variable flip angle approaches is, is very good and also fit well for the helical regions to the, uh, to the structure. Um, in order to, to test the ability to, to to restrain the, the interhelical angles between these two helices, we removed any uh, NOEs from between the two helices and also removed just the, the connection, uh, the, the residues from, from, the, uh, from, the, from the bulge here. And if we just do a, a simple um, uh, structure calculation, we can see that there's very little definition of the interhelical angle here. It ranges from with a, a beta angle of between minus 83 and 110 degrees. If we incorporate all of those carbon RDCs, proton carbon RDCs, we can recapitulate very well the kind of correct interhelical angle. And if we back calculate our, um, our variable flip angle proton nitrogen RDCs and compare it to, to the ensemble that we calculate, we get very good agreement. And if we do the, the kind of reverse experiment where we only utilize the proton um, nitrogen two bond RDCs, again, we can quite well recapitulate that into helical angle with, with a bigger range here. Um, but still, you know, this is, this is great for us if, if this is something we can apply to our large RNAs. And it, it then agrees very well with our measured proton carbon RDCs for the adenosines. Of course, the only residues we're restraining here are for the adenosines. And we think this is calculated just, this is calculated with cyana and maybe things like um, the propeller twist, et cetera, for the other residues isn't, isn't being constrained. 
Um, Excuse me, so John, he, John, we yes. have two minutes. Two ah, minutes. Well, I, I'm just finishing so I can oh, luxuriate over uh, acknowledgements. Um, so, so these approaches, we think, extend the size limit for um, kind of high resolution structural characterization of RNAs. Um, and it's, uh, most of the approaches here are applicable to RNAs on the order of kind of hundreds of nucleotides, certainly um, uh, up to the size of the RRE. And there, there's other work from our lab that is applying it to, to much larger uh, RNAs like um, dimeric uh, leader from HIV on the order of about 700 nucleotides. And so um, I'd like to, to acknowledge um, my colleagues at, at UMBC, so notably Mike, my mentor, et cetera. And uh, I've been lucky to have a, a good team of undergraduates to, to help to do most of the legwork during my time there. And, and the, the lab itself, everyone in the lab is great. And our collaborators at NIH, Ad and Nico, uh, and uh, in ASRC, Bruce, and also CRNA, HHMI, and NIH for funding, and everyone for their attention, and of course, CIL for, uh, for hosting the event. And uh, with that, I'm done. Well, thank you, John, for a very, very good talk. Um, we do have time for some questions. And I do see a question here in the, in the chat. Um, the first question is, I conceive that a large RNA has potential to have many substantially different folds with different base pairing. Do you see evidence for this in your data or is the ensemble quote unquote, dominated by a single, often predictable fold? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So um, I've, uh, I've skipped over some stuff here to, to, to try and keep it simple, but actually the RRE is a case in point. So we do see that the RRE forms two major complements. Um, I think I deleted the figure, but uh, if you're especially sharp eyed, you might have noticed that I used two different secondary structures throughout the talk. This, this was a different secondary structure to, to the one I showed at the beginning. Um, in this case, it's, it's one element that, that refold. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, but uh, I, I won't reshare. Yes, certainly, um, the, the, the RRE is a case in point. It forms two different folds. Um, I would say uh, a lot of our experience for, for these RNAs is a single fold, but that's almost used as a condition for doing the work. If, if early on, it looks like there are multiple folds, um, we might look for conditions that favor one or the other, or even do mutagenesis to favor one or the other. So all of the um, RDC stuff and pseudo contact shift stuff, we um, will use uh, mutant versions of the RRE, uh, which stabilize one or the other fold because the chemical shifts of the bits that are the same are identical. But obviously, the, 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 the two different structures are going to contribute differently to, to something like an RDC measurement. Um, so I, I hope that's, that's gone some way to answer the question. But yeah, certainly, that, that can be the case. But for doing our NMR characterization, we'll try and find a fold that, that, is, that we think is functional, because otherwise, it's, it's too complicated. OK, thanks for that answer, John. John? We have another question. Uh, it was a beautiful talk. Do you feel the adiabatic pulse-assisted measurement of RDCs can be useful in all systems with small J couplings? Um, I think that the, um, in general, I think definitely something that relies on intensity modulation is going to work much better for, um, for, for measuring small couplings. Um, I don't know whether it would be applicable to all um, all systems. I think if so, for example, we we're looking at um, the purine H8 to N7 and N9 couplings. They're also small, um, but I think that this this the 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 variable flip angle approach isn't the best choice because those two nitrogens are well separated in chemical shift. It's easy to just do a standard kind of quantitative J experiment with 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 selective pulses. Um, and you, you lose a lot of complication. Um, uh, and I think, so I think really you, you'd want to have a good reason to, to want to, to use this approach. I think it's relatively um, specialized for this set of constraints that we have for the, 
the two nitrogens being so close in, in chemical shifts and the relaxation rate being, being quite long. Um, but yeah, that, that's what I think probably. Okay, uh, we have one more question. Is the RDC data you can acquire sufficient to determine the extent of the distribution of interhelical angles, i.e. whether a range of angles are sampled? I think at, at this point, certainly that would be a, an over-analysis of, of the data. Um, to, to an extent, uh, I think we, we the, and, and the problem is, is that we, we at the moment uh, can only measure these, um, just a few bond vectors. So it's only the adenosines and it's, and it's two, two bond vectors per adenosine in the absence of any overlap. So that's the kind of perfect, um, under perfect conditions. Uh, as I say, we've got similar experiments in, in the works for looking at the uh, still in purines H8 to N7 and N9. And, and the guanosine H8 is, is actually quite well dispersed as well. So potentially we can kind of double our useful information. Um, but still, per kind of element that might be uh, relatively mobile, I think just the density of the, of the RDCs that we can measure um, is probably insufficient to be really quantitative in, in that way. You know, certainly there we can do some some hand waving, so we can independently fit the al alignment tensors for the for the different helices, and say something about the um, you know the relative uh, kind of uh, amplitude of the alignment. Um, but I think anything more quantitative of that at this stage um, is, is probably not not feasible, especially as it's difficult to 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 um, but our RNAs are quite difficult to, to generate more than one um, alignment. And so, so generating independent uh, alignments is, is, is challenging as well. We're, we're really just looking for, you know, even relatively large errors in, in these interhelical angles would be a big improvement over what we can get with, with NOEs alone. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jen, uh, for the answers. And thank you. And apologies talk. for the uh, technical, technical issues. Oh, uh, no problem. It was wonderful. Thank you. Okay.